Good morning. Thank you very much for that bell solo, that was a duet, that was wonderful. It's good to have all of you here this morning. I have a number of announcements, if you'll check out your bulletin. I'm going to uh, talk about some of the ones that are happening this week. Uh, today, uh, there is an anniversary party, 70th anniversary for the, Lind uh, the Lindquists. Uh, Gordon and Joyce at 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock at their home over on 5th Avenue. Uh, so if you want to be part of that and uh, show up to celebrate with them, uh, today is your opportunity to do that. Uh, also, uh, there is a ladies potluck and campfire Bible study on Monday, July 11th, tomorrow, up at El Canto. And everyone is, and all the ladies of the church, whether you've come recently or not, you're all invited to come on up. I'm going to meet at the church parking lot at 4.30 to carpool up uh, to Oconto. Hot dogs will be provided. Uh, bring a side dish or a dessert to share. Uh, the uh, final thing is the youth group twins game. A youth group is going to a twins game on July 13th. It's $30 plus money for snacks, and apparently they've gone cashless at uh, the stadium. So you have to have a like a gift card arrangement. So you want to, if you want to buy snacks, kids, you need to talk to uh, uh, Jake and Andrea about how you can get that done uh, before you go. So, uh, yes, so that is the events for this coming week. Uh, and we also want to talk about, give an opportunity to recite the books of the Bible in lieu of the, uh, uh, the affirmation of faith. We're going to do that together. So uh, <laughs> if you're like me and Get up in front of everybody and you're nervous and you don't think you can do it. I'm going to open to the, find a Bible and open to the front of the table of contents. And one, I think next week, what I'm going to ask is that some, if, if maybe Laura and Gail could get together and figure out one of the songs, we'll do it to music, have the kids teach us how to do it, you know, because that appears to help. Uh, but anyway, let's recite them together. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippines, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrew, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Very good. If you have been able to memorize these, if you are an adult, you need to find a child to whom you are not related and recite these uh, books of the Bible to them. And if they approve you, then you can put your name in the little book up here. Uh, and it's not the book of life, but it is a book that gets you a free chocolate bar or something, uh, other, one of the other prizes that are in there. If you are a child and you've memorized them, you need to find an adult that you are not related to and ask them to help you. And uh, they will do the same. So let's, uh, let's uh, pray together. Lord God, I give you thanks for your presence here again this morning. We come here morning after morning, and it is so good for us to be able to do that. It is so good to know, Lord, that you are here and delight in pulling us together. You value and recognize the fact that we have carved out this piece of time and so along with the time and the place that we have gathered, we give you our heart and our attitude. And we set aside and empty out everything that's in there, everything that, uh, uh, that 
separates us from you or that takes your place in our mind. And we just are quiet before you right now and ask that your spirit would speak to our spirit and be persistent in it, Lord, because we are hard of hearing so that we may learn from you what you have for us this morning and learn how to worship you in spirit and in truth. For I ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we sing, We Will Glorify, number 72 in your hymn books. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. God, thank you for all that you have given us. You have given us time. You have given us a life. You have given us resources. And we uh, return to you a portion of that, knowing that it all comes from you. And we ask that you would bless it and that you would be glorified with what happens to it next. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I really love Jesus. Tell me why you love Jesus. This is why I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Yes, I really love Jesus. Tell me why you love Jesus. 
This is why I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Tell me why you love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, church, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, we love Jesus. Do you really love Jesus? Yes, we really love Jesus. Tell me why you love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Please be seated. The first thing we teach our children is Jesus loves me. And so we're going to play it on the bells once, and then everybody can sing the two verses with us. Okay. <laughs> Start it again. Okay. Oh, this is Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Start. Oh. Okay. My turn. Okay. Okay. Sorry. We'll try it again. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. My turn.
extraordinary moment this week is to celebrate recovery and anger and this is your culture about this. Oh, kids are dismissed. moment this week is to celebrate recovery and in your hands this is your culture about this. Kids are dismissed. try to cope without you and we just really thank you for your steady steadfast love that's endures forever and so we just thank you for these um, wonderful leaders in this group who who are so dedicated in a way that um, we just pray your blessing in their life in abundant way you've come to give them life and to give it more abundantly and just really pray for your protection around them and allowing them to feel um, your Holy Spirit's just um, empowering and opening doors and allowing more and more people in this community to learn about this ministry and to feel encouraged and to celebrate not only recovery but celebrate life that you give. We really pray especially for um, uh, the child care and that right now they're really in need of somebody to step up to the plate to do that, that the person that had been doing it is um, no longer able, and so we really pray for someone to fill that gap right now, and we ask that in Jesus' name, along with um, just just all those meal preparations or, or cleaning things up afterwards in order for the leaders to focus on those who have come um, for ministering. And so we just pray for all the pieces and parts that are necessary and uh, to keep this sustainable and this ministry going through the ups and the downs. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for these wonderful people. And we call upon your angels to minister and to guide and direct their lives in all the decisions that they make for this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, Inger. Thank you. Let's uh, pray for each other. Lord God, we lift up each other here today. I think of those who are uh, battling with cancer. I think especially of Jesse and Vicki. Uh, I ask that your blessing would be on them. It's a long course of treatment. And uh, it is, Lord God, uh, important that your spirit empower them to hope and to wait on you and, and to, to find joy in the day. We rely on you to minister to them and to bring healing into their life. Pray also for Amy Schmidt's back and the operation she uh, she'll be having this uh, Thursday uh, to to correct uh, this uh, herniated disc. 
Uh, and I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, help relieve, that you would be gracious and that you would remember your love for her and relieve her from the pain that she is in right now that is pretty much constant. And uh, help her to find uh, some relief from that between now and Thursday. And that this Thursday's operation would indeed bring healing, Lord God, that you would guide the surgeon's hand. Pray for Andy, who is alone in Panama, working uh, at the mission, working on getting uh, that, uh, the boat that they have purchased for their home uh, ready for the family when they return. And I uh, pray for uh, Sparrow and Caleb, too, as uh, they're kind of in between worlds. Um, I pray for our ministries. We pray this morning, Lord God, for Celebrate Recovery, and we thank you for that ministry. Uh, and uh, and uh, for Corey and Kathy and for all those who are, who are committed, because everybody who comes is part of the ministry. They are ministers to each other, and I just pray that you would bless each of them. Pray also for uh, the ministries of Coldwater and Oconto uh, that are making the most out of each summer to... Uh, uh, to serve you at the time, uh, the short summer that we have up here. Pray that you would bless them, bless their staff. We uh, do not take for granted the safety and your provision of, of good health and, and uh, bring everybody back uh, who goes out. We look to you, Lord God, to continue to uh, bless their operations and bring blessings uh, to those that they serve in your name. Um, we ask, Lord God, for also for peace in our world, and it seems uh, beyond us. I, I, I have no instructions for you, Lord. <laughs> I, I don't know how to pray that it might even come about other than to pray that you would do something to change the direction, the trajectory of this world, and once again, uh, quiet the spiritual forces uh, that are at war and pulling us into that vortex, uh, that you would deal uh, with uh, all those who are refugees. Uh, uh, Syria and Ukraine come to mind, uh, who are countless people who are uprooted and uh, upended, uh, orphans, uh, widows. And we just ask, Lord God, uh, that somehow you would Mobilize us in some way that you would bring blessing to any who call to you right now. For we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 1. Remember this portion of the story of God as it is written in the book that we love from Psalm 1. How blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor seat in the, sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law they meditate day and night. They will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. If you had opened a psalm, first psalm, It's a short psalm, and actually a lot of the commentators and uh, biblical historians and scholars believe that this psalm wasn't one of the numbered psalms. It was like a preface in a book. It was the tone setter for all of the psalms. So psalm number one would be, uh, as one commentator put it, printed in red in the overleaf of the book or the, the inside cover. Uh, because it, was, it would set your mind in the tone for what came next. This psalm reminds us that keeping the law of the Lord is its own reward. 
And we all, most of us know this psalm and have heard it. And generally it gets filed under that heading in our mind of, uh, it's important for us to be good and not wicked so that we don't perish. And, and it has a tendency to lodge in our mind as, yes, that's right, it's important to be righteous, to do what is good, to be a good person, uh, because uh, that uh, brings blessing from God. And, and it's true in its own way, but what the psalmist says is that keeping, and, and the attitude of the psalmist is that he's not keeping God's word in order to get blessing. He's, he's saying, uh, in order that God would bless him in some way. He's saying, it's really blessing and it's nourishing to my soul to keep God's word, to do it for its own sake and its own reward. Not because it makes him a better person whom God notices and then rewards, but because keeping God's law creates the conditions that result in blessing, just like building a house creates the conditions that can sustain life in Minnesota here in the winter. Successful moral behavior, I've been thinking a lot about that. As a firstborn child in my family of fundamentalist parents, uh, being a good boy was kind of the big thing. Uh, and and uh, it was something important to learn as the important rule of my life overall. And my parents were pretty successful at it uh, uh, and instilling that in me uh, forcefully. And uh, such that uh, when I did go to my first Young Life meeting in junior high, I remember they were all there to, to be worshiping Jesus, I thought, but they... They were doing all these crazy games and silly things, and I came home and I said, you know, I didn't know that they really loved Jesus, I mean, or was about Jesus. They were doing all these games and stuff, and my own mother said to me, you know, David, it's important that you not be a prude. <laughs> <laughs> Apples and trees, Mom, we got, you know, you got to take some, but at any rate, it's true, and uh, but as, a, as a, that only child, my thought was, has always been, my go-to, my default position is to be a good person, okay? Or to try, or to think at least that that's what I ought to be, even if I'm not. Successful moral behavior, such as managing to live out the Ten Commandments, doesn't make us good people. Any more than breathing makes us good people. No one, at least no one should, congratulate themselves at the end of a day of successful breathing, saying, well, here I am. I've managed to breathe in and out all day long without a hitch. What a remarkably good person I must be. Breathing is a baseline for making physical life possible. In itself, it doesn't make us remarkably good or bad. Moral success is like spiritual breathing. It means that we have done what was necessary to avoid some of the most basic train wrecks of life. We have done what we must to steer clear of some of life's most traumatic experiences for ourselves, and we have avoided creating those tragic conditions in the lives of those around us. It's a good starting point, but it's not all there should be to life. A good moral baseline isn't enough to create a good person. I can live out all of the Ten Commandments, honoring God, my parents, respecting the bonds of trust and community by not lying or stealing or grudging others, and still be a remarkably self-centered, joyless, and loveless old sinner. Moral success doesn't make us good people, not really. It does a lot to create the conditions that make goodness possible, or at least protects us from making goodness impossible. Goodness is not something we can ever own or achieve for ourselves. And this is something hard for me to understand. I've been brought up to believe that you you make yourself a good person. You make your choices to be or to not be a good person. But that was the temptation of the knowledge of good and evil that Satan 
offered Adam and Eve in the garden, that they could define, they could define what was good on their own terms and then seize upon it, consume it, and own it for themselves. Goodness belongs only to God. When a man ran up to Jesus and knelt at his feet before him and said passionately and sincerely, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Before Jesus answered him, he came up with this thing that has always puzzled me and puzzles many of you. He said, Jesus responded to him saying in Mark 10, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. God alone. When we watched Randy Shogren take care of Carolyn and Don Lovis take care of Ruth, we were watching them surrender themselves to God's goodness and to participate in it. They became a reflection of God's goodness in those caring moments and in those acts of love. It would take a lot of the warmth and the sweetness out of their love to say that they were serving their wives in order to be good people, to create merit in themselves, that they could then trade into God for some blessing that they really wanted. What they really wanted was to bless and to create goodness for Carolyn and Ruth. Sometimes it was hard and exhausting, I'm sure, but each man loved for the sake of the one they loved, not for the sake of moral achievement or spiritual status. You catch my drift in this? When we do what is good, and the Psalms teach us that God is the one who is good, when we do what is good and forfeit the pride of thinking that we are good people, we gain the joy and delight of joining ourselves to something much bigger than we are, something much bigger than we can contain and own, something that we call the goodness of God. When we do that, we prosper, and the psalmist celebrates it. We prosper and thrive like a tree that is well-rooted by springs of water. We can rejoice in God's goodness. Randy and Don didn't create goodness. They became vessels of it. And that's a freeing thing when you think about it. Being good is burdensome. It's exhausting and it's just downright impossible and it makes a hypocrite out of everybody who tries to do it. Joining ourselves to God's goodness allows the current and the power of God to flow through us. We aren't responsible for outcomes. He is. We don't even have to like or enjoy doing what is good in the moment. Though it is the persistent testimony of many that what was burdensome at the first became joyful by God's grace when it was practiced faithfully in love. God's goodness will work itself out in us, bringing its own good fruit in us. It will create God's life in us. If we don't ruin it all by trying to own it. The Pharisees and the scribes strive to be good people. As a result, their goodness was a complicated construct of rules and regulations and past precedents that sucked all the joy out of them and those that were around them. As a matter of fact, they came to believe that being good people, they believed that they had the authority to judge those around them. As a matter of fact, they came to believe that they had not only the authority, but the responsibility to judge those around them for the people's good and for God's glory. They judged and they discarded most, and they embraced those who would play their game with them making them, as Jesus said, twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. The first verse in the psalm 
describes the process of becoming a son of hell. It's described in a reverse, backhanded fashion. It talks about the blessed man who doesn't do this. The man who is godly does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. The descent into spiritual ruin starts with walking or making choices according to the counsel or value system of this world of wickedness. And this world is all about conquest, about building up yourself, making yourself a monument to the rest of the world and conquering those who oppose you or don't agree with you. That's followed by standing or uncritically soaking in the culture of the world around us till we're no longer, we're, we're yelling just as loud. The words we're saying may be different, but we're, loud, we're shouting just as loud as the rest of the world. We're shaking our hands under everybody's, our fists underneath everybody's nose. We're screaming as much as everybody. And we end up taking a position of honor amongst the scoffers, the proud. We make fun of people to whom we feel superior because we feel that they're too ignorant and absurd to even argue with, so they can only be mocked. The Pharisees scoffed and mocked Jesus in Luke 16, and the scribes and the priests joined the Pharisees at the foot of the cross in Mark 15. Scoffing and condemning are different grapes from the same bunch. They both involve the self-assurance that goodness and righteousness are possessions that we own, giving us the right to scoff or to condemn or to attempt to overthrow others who don't recognize our spiritual excellence. The first word a verse 2 that differentiates the wicked person from the godly person is the word delight. Verse 2, but God's delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Delighting, the ability to delight, the action of delighting takes an entirely different set of spiritual muscles than scoffing. No one in scripture delights in himself, not even God. When you read, you look up the word delight, and you'll find it's always delighting in something else or someone else. Even God doesn't delight in himself. Delight is always about someone or something else other than the one who is delighted. It describes a joy that is unburdened by a preoccupation with ourselves. We're free from ourselves for that moment of delight. We are free from our self-concern and even our self-awareness. For a moment, almost by surprise, we are in wonder at the excellence of the goodness. And as it turns out, the goodness of God that is displayed in front of us. And for that holy moment, we aren't even thinking about how we can own it, consume it, exploit it, or subdue it. Instead, our desire is that we could be part of it, instead of it becoming part of us. It is a recognition and enjoyment of God's goodness in his creation. When the psalmist delights in the law of the Lord. He means that he delights in all that God is doing with his covenant people. All that his law is preparing for his people to do. The law was the minimum requirements for participation in God's salvation project, a restoration of the kingdom of God, the establishment of Mount Zion. It didn't make God's people good by doing them. It preserved them 
individually and as a society, and it showed them how they could participate in the good works that God was doing, despite the fact that they were broken by their own sin. And the psalmist recognized this over and over again. God's laws softened the hearts and directed the consciences of his people so that God could build them into a people who blessed all nations, despite themselves, not because they had become such an admirable people. Unlike the scoffers, who have no real spiritual weight or rootedness, so that winds and waves scatter and swirl, swirl their thoughts and their whatever is the hot topic and the hot issue that go back and forth. The righteous have put down roots in God and have learned delight. The scoffers condemn, mock, and they generally use their righteousness as a justification to overpower those that they look down on. And if you haven't gathered it yet, this, is, this may or may not be a religious activity. This is something that people do all the time, everywhere. The godly person meditates on the righteousness, not their own righteousness, but on the righteousness of God. And how he has called his people to surrender themselves to him. And not to be concerned that they aren't as righteous as him, but to, to try to stay on some tracks that will make them available for God's spirit so that they can participate in goodness that isn't our own. So that we can participate in God's goodness and be a part of it. In this psalm, the righteous are called to put down their roots deep enough into God's will and God's work that they learn what it is to delight in him, to lose themselves in the glory of what God is doing all around them, and to seek and to plead that God would give us a part to play in it. Pride fuels wickedness. Delight compels us to holiness. You may be excited about a political perspective that you hold, and you may use that as the righteousness from which you judge others. It may be on the left, it may be on the right. Or you may be part of the group that I find myself attracted to, which is the part that looks at the extremes and says, where are they taking us? We've all, we all of us, each of the three groups I've just mentioned, sit in the seat of scoffers to judge the others. When we are led up onto that high place to find the seat that has our name on it, with our people, who think of things and understand things the way we do, we are not being led by God's Spirit, we're being tempted by Satan. We are giving up delighting in God in order to grab a hold of the power of the fire and the passion of the law of this world, which is conquest, to overcome, to subjugate, and failing that, to burn everything to the ground. It's hard to be, first of all, because every Sunday I have to get up and talk about being a way that I'm not yet. All right, that's hard to do. You may think it's easy, and sometimes a pastor will do it by actually convincing themselves that they really are as good as the person that they script out for the 20 minutes that they're up here. I get tired of talking about stepping back from the pyre and the passion and the rage and saying it's time to delight. It's time to meditate in God's word on who he is. When 
so many, even brothers and sisters in Christ, are pounding on things and say, it's time to take a stand. It's time to do what needs to be done. It's time not to, to think, not to pray, not to meditate. It's time to start setting things on fire. And I feel, I don't know, I feel ir irrelevant. And, I, I, and yet, it's God's word that keeps. Because I want to set things on fire too. I get just as mad as everybody else. I mean, I get mad about different things. But I forget who I am. I forget who's calling me. I forget where my roots are planted. We are called to always to work from a foundation that delights in God's righteousness and who he is. And when we are freed from the burden of being good people, we are also freed from the arrogance of believing that we have a right to tell others what to do. So let's listen. Let's watch what God is doing. Let's join him in what he is doing. <clears throat> and he may call us to do many of the things that we were doing ahead of time, but... Anyway, but we'll have his perspective and his patience. The world is going to be judged. We know this. We know from every, all of the prophets we read, we know our own prophet John in, in Revelation was speaking of our own future and the future of the world we inhabit now. But when that day comes, it would, not, it would be well for us if we as God's people are found with a bucket full of water trying to put out fires than a flamethrower trying to start more. God is trying to save as many as he can. He is trying to reach out. And if we're busy sitting in the seat of scoffers, we won't be part of that ministry. So, pride fuels wickedness. Delight compels us to holiness. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I give you thanks that you are who you are. You are so different from us. Your kingdom, you said it. We all tried to pin you down. We all we even wanted to take you by force to make you our king once you fed us. Because that's what we wanted. We wanted you to make our world in the image that we had for it. And you refused to do any of it steadfastly. And you took it on the chin. What it cost you to do that because your kingdom was not of this world. You've got bigger fish to fry and the means of achieving it are not the way of this world. And we don't understand it. We can't imagine it. We don't know how to get there from here. So we surrender ourselves once again into your hands to teach us your way to do the things that don't come naturally for us. Help us, Lord God, through thanksgiving, through reading your word about you, but what, however, to search for that delight again, that wonderful holy moment where we are freed from even thinking about ourselves and our imagination of what we need to be or the world needs to be, but we are caught up in what you want it to be. For I ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Fellowship, what a joy divine.
this pilgrim leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path goes from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. And now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.